Guess what day it is? Oh, oh. It's French Friday, it's French Friday, so grab your fries and say hooray! David French is here to play on French Friday! It's French Friday! David, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, well, okay, here's the thing. The world is falling apart, David. We have multiple wars going on that we may touch on at some point in this discussion. Uh, the United States Congress is totally dysfunctional and at a standstill. Evangelical institutions are embroiled in scandal and seem to be collapsing with rapid pace. Um, before we get into all of that, though, can we just pause and have a brief moment of geeky nerddom? I, I It doesn't even have to be brief. <laughs> Well, I don't want to derail more important topics. Last okay. month when we spoke, you recommended to me an Apple TV Plus show called Silo. Yes. I watched it. Oh, my goodness. It was fantastic. It was Wasn't so, it? so good. Yes. Yes. It's so good. It's so original. Uh, there's a. It's an unfolding mystery. Uh -huh. um, it is vi brilliantly acted. Um, and yeah, the whole time you're both enjoying the show and one and thinking through the mystery and it's, yes. it's, oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. And I know apparently it's based on a set of novels and I, I I'm not going to give any spoilers here for anybody. I, I, I do recommend it. I am concerned to be honest about future seasons because I'm like, how do they, how do they make this better? Or how do they not just ruin it by, you know, jumping a shark and making it something other than what it should be that that's one concern i mean i hope i'm wrong but that's a concern but the the thing i really appreciated about this movie and this movie this series is nothing is like sacrosanct like you you think mm. there are characters here that oh yeah this is going to be our main pro protagonist or this one is right no one is safe and it keeps you on your toes yeah exactly exactly it's it's remarkable how it does that because it gives you two or three pretty dramatic twists and turns along those lines. And I don't want to say any more. Right. I don't even want to say anything beyond that because it, it will ruin things. But there are dramatic twists and turns. And so by the end, of, it's only by the very end that you sort of say, okay, <laughs> here are protagonists. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I just wanted to thank you for that recommendation it was well worth my time. Really happy about that. All right, let's turn a corner into what we're really here to talk about. And that is I want to use your recent editorial about Liberty University as a jumping off point. Um, that piece just came out recently, and it's titled, yeah. The Worst Scandal in American Higher Education Isn't in the Ivy League. Um, recent years, we've had a lot of stories about Ivy League scandals, yeah. especially around admissions with some of the bribery cases that went on. And then the more recent Supreme Court case about affirmative action kind of uncovered various practices in Ivy League schools about the way they use affirmative action, not just to try to promote minorities into um, elite schools, but really the way these elite schools protect their legacy admissions mm -hmm. and the super wealthy people under this umbrella. But you say Liberty University is a scandal that we ought to be paying attention to in part because it's symbolic of a larger crisis within yeah. American evangelicalism. So first, let's just talk about the facts. What are the details that are coming out about Liberty U that you think are so uh, scandalous? Oh, gosh. Well, it's a kind of thing like, well, how much time do you have, Sky? Because <laughs> And how far back do you want to go? But let me, let me start with what triggered the writing of the column, which was, um, a week or so ago, the new president of Liberty talked to Fox News and disclosed that Liberty was on the verge and is being considered to receive a fine, being fined by the government, about $37.5 million for violations of the Clary Act. So to put that number in perspective, when Michigan State was fined for overlooking the serial misconduct of Larry Nassar or Nasser, however you pronounce it, the, the horrible, evil um, doctor who abused so many gymnasts. The fine there was about four and a half million dollars. So Liberty, if the president is correct, may face a fine multiples greater than that. And you would say, well, what, what did Liberty do to merit a fine 
of 30, maybe up to $37.5 million. And so there was a Clary Act report that was leaked from the education department. So the education department um, leaked this report or somebody in the education department leaked the report, which shouldn't happen. Um, but this leaked report came out to a reporter at the Washington Post. And let's just, I'll read some of her, um, her description that the report paints a picture of a university that discouraged people from reporting crimes, underreported the claims it received, and at the same time marketed its Virginia campus as one of the safest in the country. Um, the report, uh, the, the Post, Washington Post report says Liberty failed to warn the campus community about gas leaks, bomb threats, and people credibly accused of repeated acts of sexual, and vi sexual violence, including a senior administrator and an athlete. A consultant told this Post reporter, this is the single most blistering Clary report I have read ever. And if you dive down into the details, it, con con uh, it includes things like destroying evidence, um, concealing crime. I mean, it's bad. Now, Liberty says some of this is not right. Um, so Liberty, Liberty sort of has three tacks it's taken in response. It says that some of it is not right. Um, you know, it says that, you know, some of the allegations the education department uh, made are inaccurate, but it also acknowledged a historic, historic gaps in compliance, Sky. So it has admitted to historic gaps in compliance, which is an interesting thing interesting phrase because it could mean gaps in the past or gaps so big they're historic <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then it has made big it has made changes on campus is spending millions more dollars on campus security and so that alone is horrible it's horrible what's going on in the clary act and that doesn't even get into sky and we don't even necessarily have to um, multiple lawsuits filed against uh, um, Liberty for overlooking or downplaying sexual assault, sexual harassment, applying the, quote, Liberty way to people when they come forward to report sexual assault, um, being told, for example, uh, allegedly being told that, well, if you make this complaint, we're going to also use some of the facts of your complaint against you in a student disciplinary process. Um, then the whole Jerry Falwell saga where he commits sexual misconducts, fired or resigns, and then he countersues Liberty. And then just last month, filed an amended complaint claiming all kinds of sexual and financial misconduct at the university that by other leading senior officials. It's just an absolute disaster. And this is the largest or second largest Christian education institution in the United States of America. Okay, so let, before we get into what what this means um a little more background as to some people might be wondering why is the federal government engaged in this to begin with because liberty university is a private university it's not a public school how can the federal government step in and fine it for these things what is the the basis for the the fine from the education department so the clary act requires federally funded educational institutions to make these reports and Liberty is a federally funded institution. It's a private Christian school that receives, I believe, maybe up to 900, uh, almost $900 million in federal funding. Um, it receives an immense amount of federal funding, just an immense amount. And this is usually, it's coming through tuition assistance and grants right. and things like GI Bill and Pell Grants and all of this stuff. All of that's federal dollars. So if you take that money in, then you have to make these reports. And, and the Clery Act, if, if I understand it, it's it's not the federal government um, putting requirements upon the content or curriculum of these universities. It's requirements to create a safe campus environment, to report crimes, to um, have procedures for sexual assault, things like that. So it's really about the protection and safety of the students, right. not the content of what is being taught at the university. No, no, no. So this right. is... It's a transparency statute that says, because lots of parents want to know how safe, lots of students want sure. to know how safe is this school? How much of a crime problem does it have? And schools have to report their crime statistics is one element of the Clary Act. So this is not 
hyper-intrusive federal government interfering with religious liberty. This is a rule that applies to everyone. If you take in that federal money, you're just going to have to disclose certain facts about crime on campus and sexual assault and sexual you know, misconduct. So a question this raised for me, which I don't think you addressed in your piece, is why has it taken so long for the Department of Education to come after Liberty if it has historic reporting errors or noncompliance with this act? Why is it only coming out now at almost a $40 million level? That's a great question. But, you know, the Education Department, it's it's self-reports. So it's not like the Education Department is coming in and auditing you all the time. So a lot of this is just the honor system, basically. And so the education department generally only is sort of a follows the leader, if that makes sense, where once there are facts that surface that indicate that maybe the school has been underreporting, then it might dive in and investigate. Um, so there have been a lot of scandals at Liberty, and we, we barely even scratched the surface. There have been a lot of scandals at Liberty, including some major independent reporting from ProPublica, for example, outlining a lot of the facts that would cause the federal regulators to say, huh, hmm. doesn't seem like they're complying. And then these federal investigations, they just take time. But it was in 2021 where ProPublica put out a major report about the Liberty Way and how it impacts has impacted sexual assault reporting or uh, sexual misconduct reporting. And so that is, that may be, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what triggered uh, the, the education department. In I mean, this is obviously pure, pure speculation, but in, in throughout the Trump era, and even before he was elected president, Liberty and Jerry Falwell Jr. were increasingly politically active in supporting Donald Trump and supporting conservative causes. And I wonder if having more of a spotlight on liberty and its leadership in the political realm drew more scrutiny from people like ProPublica and other journalists. And they started looking under the hood of what's really going on at liberty. That reporting ends up going public in 2021, as you mentioned, with all the sexual harassment and misconduct uh, stuff going on at liberty, which then eventually gets on the radar of the education department. And so in a weird way, maybe this was the unintended consequence of its political activism drawing attention and scrutiny. Otherwise, they could have flown under the radar a whole lot longer. Yeah, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a politician with just obvious, open, horrible skeletons, not even in the closet, like spilling out into the hallway going, I'm running for president, <laughs> you know? And right. so Liberty put itself front and center through Jerry Falwell Jr. with the picture of that, you know, him and Trump in front of the Playboy cover and all of this. So Liberty puts itself through Jerry Falwell Jr. just front and center as sort of, you know, Jerry Falwell Jr. is a key Trump ally. He has, he's a, pres a president of a Christian university, seems to have a direct line to the president of the United States. Liberty was able to capitalize on that kind of arrangement and that relationship to sort of make itself more of a player publicly. Right. Meanwhile, it's a cesspool of corruption and scandal. And so it's so much like so many of our political scandals now, Sky, where you say, what were they thinking stepping into the public square like that? Well, the connection I want to draw, and you do this a bit in your piece, is how Liberty, though an extreme and very visible example, is po following a pattern that we see, frankly, in a lot of American evangelical institutions, churches, ministries, nonprofits, where the mindset seems to be when bad things happen, when abuse occurs, when leaders abuse their power, when there's corruption, Let's cover it up because we can't let people see what's really going on because it would be bad for the kingdom. It would be bad, not just for our institution, but for the reputation of our faith. So we need to keep it quiet. You kind of, you saw this with the SBC cover up of sexual abuse and the moving yeah. of abuse of pastors in different places. To protect the institution. Yep. Right. Your wife has reported about this at the Canacook mm -hmm. camps and the sexual abuse that happened there and the cover up of that abuse. What is it about evangelicalism, at least in the United States, that you think perpetuates this kind of posture towards abuse? I think it is the intimate connection between the evangelical movement and the culture war. Now, 
that's what makes it worse. I do think there's just a instinctive human response that we have, sure. which is that ev- that everybody wrestles with, which is, oh no, my institution has been caught. Oh no, I've been caught. We need to minimize the damage. That's a normal human impulse. Right. That scripture rebukes. Just because it's a normal human impulse doesn't make it okay. If scripture rebukes that. We have a higher call. But the culture war then takes that and metastasizes that because essentially what you have is a a sense and a view that is per, put into the evangelical public that it some, goes something like this. We are good people with good institutions who are under unfair attack from evil people and evil institutions. That in a nutshell is sort of the messaging of every culture war organization in the Christian community. Good people, good un- institutions, followers of Jesus Christ under attack from, uh, you know, a dark and evil, godless world. And so it creates this permanent sense of siege. And so anything that undermines the defenses, the siege defenses, is seen as betrayal, is seen as um, treason. And so if you're somebody, and I know Sky, you and Phil and the Holy Post team get this all the time. I get this all the time. Why are you highlighting, say, Canacock or Liberty or SBC or Ravi Zacharias when when the trans agenda is out there or this right. is going on out there? And so, and then you're contributing to uh, secularization by your turning people against the church, you know, it's sort of another, another, uh, attack used and it really is rooted in this sort of per- sense of permanent siege we're the good embattled team or the good embattled force in like some sort of spiritual alamo and so therefore we have to rally together to confront this external attack and the interesting thing is guys i point out in the piece this is pretty much the exact opposite of the pauline approach <laughs> so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, quite famously, he starts off by excoriating this church. He says, there's sexual immorality among you of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. So he's pulling no punches saying, you're worse than the world. And then he goes on and he's... But David, before you go on with Paul. Okay. Okay. Unlike you, Paul was not writing in the New York Times. (laughs) <laughs> he was writing directly to the church at Corinth, and some people who criticize you and who criticize me in the Holy Post argue that, well, you guys are airing the dirty laundry of evangelicals for non-believers to see, and that's not okay. You should be doing that privately. You should be doing that behind closed doors. You shouldn't be writing about these things on on public forums where everyone can see the horrible stuff that's going on in our churches or institutions or camps or whatever. How would you respond to that? I mean, of course, just as a matter of fact, the most public forum, the most public publication in the whole history of humanity is the Bible. Well, well Paul didn't so, know he was writing that that this was going to be canonized for all the world to see throughout <laughs> history. He was writing a letter to the Corinthians. Yes, but this idea that we're just sort of peeking in on an entirely private correspondence versus learning of a truths that are supposed to apply to the church for all time. Um, if if the airing of the dirty laundry was supposed to be entirely private, uh, that would be an admonition. Uh, now, we are, when we do have a personal issue with people that we know, there should be some private communications. You should go to people privately. But that is also an extraordinarily abused passage as well Sure, that has been used to assist in cover-ups of gross behavior. So the principle here is that here's what he's doing is he's taking a church that, by the way, the Corinthian church was in more peril than the American church. Can we just say that? Like under more siege than the American church. Like the Corinthian church would look at the American church and say, you guys think you're under siege? Yeah, they were far more fragile. Yeah, far more fragile, and then and then he's calling them out for their misconduct, and then he goes on and he says this really interesting thing, which is, 
and, and I'll read here. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. He says, now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, idolater, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. That is the real heart of it here, because what it's saying is your emphasis on discipline and judgment should be within the church. It is not, your emphasis is not outside of the church. It is within the church. And what I'm saying is we've gotten that backwards in this culture war construct, which is says, which says, hey, we have to rally together inside the church. We cannot undermine, we cannot engage in conduct that would undermine sort of our sense of how strong and good and virtuous we are inside the church because the threat outside the church is so overwhelming. And that's exactly backwards. Our rigor, the rigor should be internal. <laughs> right. We should be least tolerant of what's happening, say, at Liberty. What, what Paul's um, operationalizing here is Jesus' well-known instruction to remove the log from your own exactly. eye first, rather than pointing out the speck exactly. in your brothers. And this is a case, at least in Corinth, where Paul's saying, you have a huge incestuous log in your own eye, church in Corinth. Yep. Don't be pointing out the sexual immorality of those outside the church, because yours is even worse. Okay, um, to go back to my question a few minutes ago, and... and <laughs> And your, your response is fair, but I think, um, I think part of what justifies you writing about this in the New York Times or Phil and I talking about it on the Holy Post or your wife writing about the Canicook camp stuff going on is the fact that in, in these cases, whether it's Liberty or, or SBC or some of these megachurch scandals, in most of these cases, the internal confrontation was not occurring it's evident that the SBC was not internally wrestling with and dealing with its sexual abuse scandal. Liberty was not internally trying to correct what was going on on its campus and report fairly and, and protect its students. Uh, Canacook was not being transparent with itself and its workers about what it was doing. And when that internal confrontation doesn't occur, then it often has to be brought to their attention and the public gets to, to see that as well. So if, if things were handled the way Paul handled it with Corinth or the way Jesus instructs in Matthew 18, then maybe these publicly embarrassing articles wouldn't be written because it would be handled internally, but it's not. Well, and, and I think people understand that no institu institution of humans is perfect and there will be people who commit acts of misconduct in every institution. And the of judgment... Course. The, the way you judge an institution is how it responds to that. And so, you know, if Canacuck in 1999, when it found out that this camp counselor was um, do it, playing nude games with boys, then the, the, when the camp reacts to that properly, it fires him immediately before there is any further misconduct. And it's a 100% different reality that exists from the reality that we live in today. And similarly with Liberty, when Liberty, you know, when Liberty received crime reports, if it had been truthful, if when it received allegations of sexual assault on behalf, you know, by from students, if it responded to those things appropriately or disciplined those who did not respond appropriately, we're just in a whole different universe. And so what's happening is You've had institution after institution break through all of its internal safeguards. I mean, not just break through, just gallop through, stampede through internal safeguards, show no real capacity for repentance and reflection, maximum capacity for in suppressing internal dissent and punishing whistleblowers, and then saying, how dare you air my dirty laundry, which is just... It's a, it's a critique I just don't even take seriously, honestly, Sky. It's, you just, I just don't take it seriously. And the other thing is, by the way, a lot of Christians read the New York Times. I'm, I'm so tired of this idea. <laughs> you know, I would say, you, you take your Christian publication, whatever it is, and I would say on a given Sunday, 
more Christians might be reading the New York Times than are reading whatever Christian publication you think is acceptable for this to be put into. Yeah, but those are clearly backslidden Christians, David. So let's <laughs> let's be clear on yeah. that. Um, I, yeah. Yeah. And when it, you know, it's one thing to say, stop airing my dirty laundry, but you're the one who keeps crapping in your own shorts and we have to air <laughs> the dirty laundry. So if you would just, you know, control yourself yeah. a little bit, maybe this wouldn't be an issue. Today's episode is sponsored by Sundays. This is Phil. I have a dog. You have a dog. We love our dogs and we got to feed them something. Fresh food with human grade ingredients is a better way to treat our dogs than that old bag of whatever that stuff is. Sawdust and cow bones? I have no idea. But fresh pet food is expensive and inconvenient. And that's where Sundays comes in. No, not the day. The new dog food company that makes air dried dog food from a short list of human grade ingredients. It's healthy with beef, chicken, and digestive aids like pumpkin and ginger. It's convenient. Unlike other fresh dog foods, it's zero prep, zero mess, and zero stress. Sundays is shelf stable and ships right to your door. And it's affordable, costing 40% less than other healthy dog food brands because they don't waste money shipping frozen packages. We've got a special offer for our dog-loving holy posters. Get 35% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash holypost or use the code holypost at checkout. That's Sunday sundaysfordogs.com forward slash holy post. Upgrade your pup to Sundays and feel good about the food you feed your dog. And thanks to Sundays for sponsoring this episode. All right, I want to turn a corner because when I read your piece about liberty and your analysis of it, I wholly agree with you on it and and that siege mentality and the need to kind of protect our internal reputation from the, the, the big bad evil world outside of us. But as I read your piece, I in my imagination, drew connections to two other ongoing stories that are in the media. And this is going to sound strange, but here's where my mind went. In the last couple days, I've been watching the unfolding drama in the House of Representatives with the Republicans' inability to elect a new Speaker of the House. We saw McCarthy get get removed from his position a few weeks ago. Steve Scalise was nominated. He couldn't get enough votes. Then Jim Jordan was nominated. He couldn't get enough votes. And in the last couple of days, we've heard an interesting um, line of argumentation coming from some of the Republican representatives arguing that this is actually the Democrats' fault <laughs> because the Democrats largely voted opposing all of these Republican speakers, and therefore they're the ones who are sending Congress into this chaotic situation, which is just bizarre when you consider that the Republicans have the majority and yeah. by themselves could elect whoever they wanted to be the House Speaker, but they're trying to make it the Democrats' fault. Okay, so hold on to that story. And then you have the, the really tragic events that are occurring right now in Israel and Gaza. Mm-hmm. And without getting into the nitty-gritty of that horrific situation, a lot of the rhetoric, at least that you're hearing here in the United States from activists on both sides, is uh, a kind of blind... 100% support for Israel or a blind 100% support for the Palestinians with no nuance and trying to make the whole situation entirely one side's fault or the other. And so in all three of these stories, whether it's Liberty, the Republicans in the House, or the Israel-Gaza conflict, it feels like people who are 100% bought into their side lack the ability to internally scrutinize the faults in their own identity group and therefore project the entire fault to the other group. In other words, going back to Jesus' words, they're not looking at the log in their own eye at all. It's 100% the speck in the other side's eye. Um, am I analyzing this correctly, or do you think I'm oh. overstating it? No, you're you're 100% correct. And it's so funny you, you bring this up, Sky, because I just had a very similar conversation on uh, our recording advisory opinions earlier about how when you adopt the activist mindset or the partisan mindset, how that distorts uh, your thinking. Right. And because one of the things that an activist or partisan mindset is, it's very much like a lawyer mindset in litigation. And in litigation, if you're a lawyer, you're wholly behind, completely behind your client. And any negative fact, it is your job to minimize or explain away. 
any fact that is positive for your client, it is your job to magnify and state that is what their defining characteristic is. And now it works in a courtroom because, you know, the adversarial process, which includes cross-examination and all of this, is one of the greatest fact-finding developments, you know, in human civilization. But it only works in a courtroom, Sky. It only works in a courtroom. It does not work once you leave those walls because rules of evidence uh, don't apply anymore. There's no judge. There's no true jury. It is a free-for-all. And then what ends up happening is people get in this position where they will not say true things. This happens all the time. They will not say true things for fear that by saying true things, they will give ammunition to their opponents. Exactly. And if you're somebody who is not a partisan on either side, it can be crazy making to experience. It just, you look at it in, in very much very much the way that a, like watching the House Republican thing unfold, it was crazy making to hear some of the rhetoric. Yeah. Um, uh, earlier so it, this, it, yeah, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, er, earlier gonna... this this weekend, I was listening to an interview with Tom Friedman, a colleague of mm -hmm. yours at the New York Times, who's who's written a ton about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict over the last 30 years and getting his analysis of what's going on there right now. And he said something very interesting. He said, somehow we have to, this is not an exact quote, but you know, summary of his argument, somehow we have to hold two seemingly contradictory things in our head at the same time. And he said, number one, over the last century or so, he says, you, you have to recognize that Israel has accomplished an unbelievably amazing feat in establishing itself as a nation in the Middle East and creating a democratic society that is in many ways flourishing and economically prosperous and scientifically advancing things and incredible industry going on there. It's just a remarkable feat of achievement that Israel has done. And it's a, it's a wonderful, beautiful uh, society. He said, at the same time, you also have to acknowledge that Israel has been unjust towards the Palestinians. It has violated agreements. It has in, uh, built settlements in areas that it was not supposed to build them. And that there are legitimate grievances that Palestinians have against the way the state of Israel has acted at different times over the past hundred years. And to admit both of those things is not a betrayal of Israel. Yeah. It's just an acknowledgement of reality. You could add a third one in there. You can also acknowledge that what Hamas did on October 7th, was that the date of the attack? Mm -hmm. was horrific and unjustifiable and, and a terrorist act of, of amazing consequence and brutality. That in no way dismisses what Israel has done, which is at times unethical and unjust in its dealings with the Palestinians. But people seem unwilling to entertain the fact that all these contradictory truths can be true at the same time because they want to be 100% for their team. And to right. admit Ex anything other than that is to betray your team. Exactly. And you see this with Israel and foreign policy within the evangelical world more than with any other country. Yeah. Because Israel, for a bunch of complicated reasons, um, is sort of kind of pulled into the our, it's it's part of our team, sort of written more broadly. And so we know how we treat people who are part of our team, which is we maximize their virtues, we minimize or excuse away their faults. And Israel, like every human institution has faults. Israel has done wrong things. You can say that without justifying one scintilla of atrocities against Israel. Right. There's no justification for what Hamas did. And we get in this weird world where we say, well, if you're admitting that Israel has faults, then somehow, especially now, you're justifying what Hamas did. No, I have written, there's almost 3,000 words that I've written in the New York Times about how Hamas should be treated like ISIS now, that Hamas is acting like ISIS, Hamas should be treated like ISIS, and here's how you can defeat Hamas while complying with the laws of armed conflict. I wrote almost 3,000 words on that in the Times. And so, no, I do not, under no circumstances, believe that there is a justification for what Hamas did. And Hamas, I believe, should be removed, utterly defeated. But that is also not to say that that therefore means that Israel's record of its conduct towards the Palestinians is without blemish. And... I don't understand why we can't hold these thoughts together at the same time. It's only in this world where everything is zero sum, hyper partisan. The other side is so bad that if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. 
that's why I've said from the beginning a year when I when I saw a lot of this unfolding, like right before the Trump era, I was speaking to a group of Christian law students, and I said, "Your ultimate act of defiance isn't just opposing the left. Your ultimate act of defiance is telling the truth. Hmm. That's your ultimate act." So one of the things I've been studying that's tr- to, in order to make sense of all these different things, including the craziness within some evangelical sectors, is social identity theory. And it, it was a view that kind of developed in the 1970s amongst, among psychologists to help make sense of the way people construct their identity. And as I'm sure you know, when, when adolescents are trying to figure out who they are, and differentiate themselves from their family of origin or from their parents, they will try on different identities. And social identity theory said, we don't just do that as individuals, we do that as groups. One of the ways we form our identity is by identifying with different groups of people. And they talk about in-groups and out-groups. Yeah. Um, I have a son who's a freshman in college right now, and he's looking at different fraternities and may decide to rush one of these fraternities next semester. And and that it's like a very structured, vivid example of this. Like you try on these different groups and go, hmm, do I want to be associated with that group identity or this group identity? Um, but where it gets kind of weird is when you strongly identify with an in-group, sometimes the definition of who that in-group is becomes... Uh, formed by who the out group is. And the example I've used to write about this is my father-in-law. I married into like a, a, a rabid Cubs fan family. <laughs> right. And, and I love them for that. And in fact, my wife's great-great-grandfather played for the Cubs back in the 1800s and was inducted in the Baseball Hall of Fame. So like they have legitimate reason to be huge Cubs fans. But you ask my father-in-law who his favorite baseball team is, and he'll say the Chicago Cubs and whoever is playing the White Sox. Because part for him of being a Cubs fan means hating the White Sox, right? Yes. And there's many sports rivalries that are like that. Yeah. The problem is this ends up in different fields beyond sports. So sociologists talk about negative partisanship, where being a, a conservative Republican today isn't necessarily about what conservatism or Republicans stand for. It's hating the libs. Yeah. And whatever the liberals are for, you're against. And even in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, when you study the history of this, I mean, 100 plus years ago when it was the Ottoman Empire that ruled in that part of the land, Christians, Muslims, and Jews occupied that land together in relative peace. And it wasn't until Zionism and the Belfer Declaration and, and, and Jews started settling in that land and, and creating a homeland there that a sense of Palestinian identity really started to coagulate. And it, it mm. was largely, we're not Jews, and they're coming to take our land. And you can see the in-group identity of Palestinian was largely defined by the out-group identity of Jewish or Israeli. Mm-hmm. But the stronger the out-group identity becomes, or defining yourself against other things, the harder it is to be self-reflective about your own group's faults and shortcomings, mm-hmm. the log in your own eye. So David, to turn all this around, how do we as Christians resist the currents in our culture of this social identity theory stuff that, that you have to, by all means, guard your identity and define yourself against everyone else? What resources can we draw from theologically or even practically yeah. to prevent falling into this trap? You know, it, it's, it's a great question. And I think so much of your understanding of Scripture depends upon the lens with through which you're reading it. Because I loved your discussion with N.T. Wright, for example, about were we reading Romans through sort of a medieval mystic kind of construct, or do you read Romans in the way that it's most likely that Paul meant it to be read, or by yeah. the with, from the standpoint of the audience that was this was written to, right? Which is a really, it was, that was such a great podcast, by the way. We were just talking about it at dinner last night with my church small group. But um, the, so the lens with which you read is, is really, really important. And so there's a couple of things that I've kind of done in recent years. One is reading, read the New Testament, the Gospels and the New Testament, through the prism of every syllable of this is written to an extremely persecuted, powerless minority, which is true, Mm -hmm. which is true. Um, 
it's really remarkable. The admonitions about loving your enemies and blessing those who persecute you really become far more challenging than they are now when, quite frankly, somebody, most of most of my quote unquote enemies or whatever, the worst they're going to do to me is tweet at me <laughs> or write an angry article about me. Now, yeah. there are some who've in the past tried to go well beyond that, but sure. Yeah. You've but seen the, the worst majority, of that stuff. That's the, the, again, the Corinthian church would not look at that as adversity. Right. And, and so it really helps understand the sort of the magnitude of the call put on your life to or towards loving your enemies, blessing those who persecute you, what it means to exhibit the fruits of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit in the context of adversity. And then, the other thing is it, it starts to make sense of how comprehensively the Bible essentially is telling us to defy our sin nature. The last shall be first, you know, die to yourself. Because to escape this social identity theory, you kind of really, because it's so much a part of who we are, our human nature, it really brings to life the whole notion of what it means to die to yourself. We think of that as, well, just don't be selfish. No, no. It means put to death your incl many of your inclinations, which are often just instinctively wrong. <laughs> and that's, that's that high call that's placed on our life. Thank God for his abundant grace because it is a high call. But I thought about that a lot in the context of the times where there is such a great pressure to join the tribe, especially in a, in a country that is moving more towards a shame honor construct. Mm. If you take tribalism, throw shame honor on top of it, it gets really dangerous very, very quickly. And so that whole construct is one of the things that we're putting to death in ourselves. Um, it's that human inclination that leads us to sometimes just clump together even with evil people out of sort of a sense of community solidarity or you name it. Yeah, that's a good word. I, I've i been trying to figure out how to communicate this. And one of the things that comes to mind, I'm, I may need to test drive this in some setting, but I think one of the things that evangelicalism has actually managed to do fairly successfully, maybe with diminishing <laughs> returns here, is it has inculcated a sense of group identity. There is a, 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 a sense of you belong to this evangelical tribe or you belong mm -hmm. to this conservative tribe. Maybe even in politics, you belong to this Republican tribe. And so once you strongly identify with that group, like you've been saying in that siege mentality especially, it's very hard to be self-critical. But I don't see that in the New Testament. I don't see, I mean, there's, there's a very strong emphasis on the church, obviously, in the New Testament, mm -hmm. but ultimately where Paul and the other New Testament writers root our in-group identity is they say you are in Christ. Yes. And for me, to be in Christ means I can't, I can't just blindly accept the actions and behaviors of other groups that I'm a part of, if those actions or behaviors are contrary to the way of Christ. On the flip side, when a group I am not a part of, an out group, does something which is consistent with the character and nature of Christ, I should be quick to celebrate and affirm that, even though they're not my in-group identity. So to be in Christ means he is the standard by which I judge myself and my communities and my groups, including those outside, not my group identity is how I judge Jesus. But it seems like we've got that backwards. Yeah. You know, and there's, there's a reason why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. It gave us a fixed star, a north star a, in the person of Jesus Christ. It is not that the church is the way, the truth, and the life. It is not that any other pastor is the way, the truth, and the life. It is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And this is one of the things that I thought was really distressing. Um, and I think we talked about this guy, this study a year or so, maybe a little longer than that ago, that we came out by from Legionnaire that is a vast majority of Christians can absolutely identify Orthodox Christian teaching on sexual morality but majority of Christians don't know who Jesus actually is. 
And, right. They they don't affirm his deity. Right. And yeah. so you're thinking, wait, if he is the way, the truth, and the life, then understanding him is job one. Okay. And it's not that the other the moral the moral questions about sex and sexuality aren't important. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it is not job one. <laughs> Job one is that identification with Jesus Christ. That's job one. And that should ideally, although each of us is, is tempted away from this, that should ideally begin to separate us from group identity, even if it doesn't, of course, separate us from obligation, community obligations. There's a difference. There's a difference. Right. It should separate us from group identity while maintaining our sense of, of community obligations. Yeah, I think what you're what you're identifying there with that survey, that Legionnaire's report, is that evangelicalism, at least in the United States, has probably done a better job at forming people's sense of group identity into conservative cultural and political values mm -hmm. than it has in forming people's group identity in Christ. We haven't We've conflated the two. So there's a lot of people running around right now in America who identify as evangelicals, who hold internally consistent theolo uh, political and cultural views, who may know nothing about the doctrinal and theological convictions historically of evangelicalism. And, and that's kind of the scandal that we're talking about here. So a group at Liberty University who can claim to be an evangelical university can politically aligned with the Republican Party, can align themselves with Donald Trump, can fight the culture wars all the while, not do what's what they're expected to, both by the federal government and by Christ, to protect their students from sexual assault. Right. But they don't see the internal contradiction there because they are wholly consistent with their political philosophy, even if they're not consistent with what they claim to be their theological tradition. And then the other aspect of this sort of group identity um, is that you end up, what, what always tends to happen is that the flaws or sins that tend to beset members of the group identity become minimized. Right. And the flaws or sins that define the outgroup become the most important things for you to think about and talk about. And so, you know, one, I've, I've gotten this question a lot of times, why is there so much emphasis, for example, in online right-wing Christianity about trans issues mm -hmm. when the reality is if you go and you you I, i've told this story before but i was talking to a small group of pastors and they're asking me a bunch of stuff about trans issues and i asked how many how many of the pastors had a single trans member of the congregation and not a hand went up mm -hmm. okay well that's that's a feature in some of this world not a bug because why because the trans issue is a them problem right and we can unite the congregation by talking about all of the them problems. But the instant something is an us problem, then it becomes, well, circle right back to the start of our conversation. Why are you bringing this up? Why are you? And it's so when it's a them problem, we can be united in the righteous anger. When it's an us problem, that's when it gets really hard. Yeah, and this is exactly the brilliance of what Jesus does in John 8 with that scene where the woman is caught in, caught in adultery and everyone's picking up stones ready to, to kill her. And Jesus says, let the one who's without sin cast the first stone. And then one by one, they all drop their stones and walk away. Because when it was about adultery, well, you know, all the people who had not committed adultery picked up stones in a self-righteous way and were ready to kill this woman. But the moment Jesus expanded it and said, no, let's talk about sin in general— and then they go, oh, crap, I, I guess yeah. I am guilty of sin, and they drop it. And so— okay, let's make the big fight about trans issues, and all of us who don't have an issue there can pick up our stones and get self-righteous about it. But Jesus is going, well, let's talk about the log in your own eye, evangelical church, and maybe that log is not trans issues, but there's plenty of other stuff, but we don't want to go near that. And uh, that same mentality, again, comes into our geopolitics when we look at Israel yeah. and Palestine. It comes into our national politics when you look at what's going on in the, in the Congress right now, and it gets into the culture war stuff, and it even gets down into our congregational lives as we, you know, divide and pick sides and, and don't call out sin in our own groups. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's remarkable how this group identity stuff 
helps give us gives us a lens to understand the dynamics at all these different levels. All right, to to end where we began, David, before we wrap up for this month, is there any other geeky nerdy stuff you want to recommend to me before we go? Because I need something to distract me from all these terrible stories that are going on in the real world. I hear you. I hear you. Have we talked about foundation before? No, I don't think we have. Have you seen it on Apple TV? No, you seem to really like the Apple TV sci-fi stuff. They are pouring money into it, Sky. So Foundation is based on the Isaac Asimov classic yeah. novels, which were generally considered to be sort of, you can't make these suckers into a movie or a TV. They're just too sprawling, too big, too... Uh-huh. So what Apple TV is did is it took the basic concept a foundation that essentially there's this galactic empire set way, way, way into the future. It's all humans. It's not like Star Wars. And the galactic empire is on the verge of fall of a fall. I'm not doing any spoilers. This is the basic concept. And a group called the Foundation believes it can shorten the fall. In other words, it can if it can prevent humanity from spiraling into thousands of years of chaos. Okay. Um, that's the setup. <laughs> and it is beautifully shot like the special effects are mind-blowing they're incredible yeah mm. the biggest tv you have watch it on this is not something to watch on your phone um biggest tv you've got watch it and it's just very well done and what i i say is wait through the first half of the pilot because in the first half of the pilot some of it seems a little weird like you've jumped in on a conversation that it's halfway through in other words, like, I don't understand this world. I don't understand this world building. It feels a little strange. But by the end of the pilot, you, you're, there's an incident that occurs in the pilot and you're kind of hooked. And then the show is really, really good at just each episode just giving you enough of sort of unlocking the mystery of the show to keep you going. Because this, like mm. Silo, has a mystery element to it. And it, okay. All right. it just keeps unfolding and unfolding. And there are some pretty shocking twists and turns as well. And the production values are through the roof. I just finished watching both seasons. And now I'm going to, I'm I'm begging Nancy, my wife, I'm begging her to watch it. And so we're going to rewatch. Uh, so. All right. Well, I, I I will give it a shot. I, I, okay. I don't always agree with your take on this kind of stuff because we have our disagreements about certain DC <laughs> movies. But I will give it a shot. I, I, I want to recommend something to you, which is not sci-fi Ooh. Ooh, nerd stuff. Okay. I, mean, I don't know if you've seen it yet on Netflix, but there's a, a documentary series about David Beckham, the famous soccer no, player. No, I've heard that's incredible. It is so good. And I ended up watching it because my wife loves soccer. She's just loves, loves, loves soccer. So she started watching it, and I'm kind of catching it out of the corner of my eye, and then I got hooked. I didn't know much at all about David Beckham, but it's really compellingly done. And it, it you get a glimpse into his personality, and they show him doing things just around his house. He's clearly an obsessive personality. He's a perfectionist. Yeah. Like he, uh-huh. you know, after everyone goes to bed at night, he cleans the house and in, in meticulous detail because he likes things to be a certain way. And you begin to get an understanding of why he was so good at soccer, because he would practice mm. and practice and practice until... He knew he could get that corner kick just right. And beyond that, like their personal lives and stuff, it's a really fascinating glimpse into someone's life that lived through... I mean, we're almost exactly the same age, he and I. And so to think about what he had to deal with and an entire country hating him for, yeah. you know, 1998, 99, that era. Like, it's just a... You need to watch it. It's such an interesting study on human psychology and, and social dynamics and really, really brilliant. Interesting. Okay. No, you're you're about the third or fourth person who's recommended that, and so I'm going to watch it. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, hopefully we can both get some escape from the dire realities around us, but I hope you don't escape too long because we need you to keep writing and helping us <laughs> think about it well. So thanks for being back with us, David. Oh, thanks so much, Sky. Next month, I cannot wait for you to tell me how much you love Foundation. <laughs> okay. Maybe we need to switch this whole podcast away from current <laughs> events and commentary into just media, but... We'll do one of those episodes here soon. Thanks, David. Thanks, Guy. French Friday is a production of Holy Post Media, featuring David French and me, Sky Jatani. Music and theme song by Phil Vischer. This show is made possible by Holy Post patrons. To find out how you can become a Holy Post patron and to find more common good Christian content, 
go to holypost.com.